Hello and uh, welcome everyone. Sorry for the delays due to technical issues. Uh, welcome to the second press conference at the joint EPSC-DPS meeting from here in Geneva. Uh, I'm Shantanu Naidu, the DPS press officer, and with us are Anita, Livia, and Adriana, who are the EPSC-DPS press officers for this meeting. We had a slight change in the schedule. The OSIRIS-REx mission people had to withdraw their talks, but we still have three great talks today. Uh, first, we'll have Makoto Yoshikawa uh, and Antonella Barucci talking about observations of Ryugu uh, by the Hayabusa 2 mission, uh, followed by Frank Marches from SETI Institute, uh, who will talk about uh, occultation observations of Orus, which is a Lucy's space mission target. So we'll uh, have the three talks first, and then we'll take questions later. And also, I'd like to remind you to do silent or switch off your cell phones. So take it over. OK. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Makoto Yoshikawa, and uh, uh, me and uh, Antuna Valucci uh, will talk about the uh, Hayabusa 2 mission. So first, uh, my talk is, uh, uh, the impact experiment and the second touchdown. Okay, at first I show you uh, this slide. Uh, this is a Hayabusa mission flow. Uh, so a spacecraft, Hayabusa 2 spacecraft uh, launched in 2014. And uh, one year later, uh, it came back to the Earth to perform Earthing by. And then uh, Hayabusa 2 arrived at Ryugu uh, June last year. And uh, we had a uh, lot of observations. And uh, 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 last year in September, uh, we released two small rovers, Minerva 2 1. And then uh, October, uh, we released a mascot, uh, which was made by Diela and Knez. And the uh, first touchdown uh, was carried out in February in this year. And then in April, uh, we did the uh, impact experiment uh, to create the small crater on the surface of Ryugu. And the second touchdown was executed uh, in July. So up to here, uh, all the mission uh, was, were finished, and uh, they, they were all successful. And still, we have one more uh, small rover, Minerva 2.2. Uh, we will release this uh, in next, next month. And the spacecraft will uh, leave Ryugu at the end of this year. And uh, at the next year, uh, uh, Earth return. So this is for our mission. And uh, today, I talk about the impact experiment and the second touchdown. So, uh, uh, last April, uh, spacecraft uh, went down to uh, this altitude. This is about 500 meters from the surface of Ryugu. And uh, it released small uh, impactor, we call SCI, small carrion impactor. And uh, this impactor uh, went down slowly, but uh, during that, uh, spacecraft quickly moves from here to horizontally and then vertically because the, the CI uh, explodes uh, just 40 minutes later. So spacecraft must be, uh, must hide behind the asteroid. But uh, if spacecraft is here, uh, we cannot see uh, the impact event. So before that, a spacecraft release small camera we call DCAM-3 deployable camera here, and this camera observe uh, the impact event. And then spacecraft uh, go back to the home position. And next, we try to, uh, do the, uh, tried to do the second touchdown, not inside the uh, crater created, but, the, uh, but uh, outside, but uh, quite near to, to a sea crater, about 20 meters from the crater uh, to get the uh, subsurface material. Okay, so uh, this is uh, 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 images. Uh, this is uh, just after separation of a sea, like this. And uh, after 40 minutes, it exploded, and uh, we, we, we saw uh, these uh, 
uh, eject the curtain from the surface of Ryugu. So uh, impact experiment was successful. And later, spacecraft go back to the impact point, and uh, we saw this one. Uh, this is before uh, impact, after impact, and this is a comparison. So you can see clearly that there is a uh, very big crater. And the size is about 15 meters in width. And the depth is about two or three meters. So uh, the, the size was quite large, much larger than we have expected. So next thing is to get the subsurface material. So we studied, we observed uh, the region near this impact crater. And uh, this figure shows the uh, color change. The dark area means the uh, change in reflectance uh, before and after SCA impact. And uh, this means that dark area means there is a uh, subsurface material distributed. So uh, if we go there, we can get the subsurface material. So uh, we select this C01C area for the second touchdown place. And also, we have a spectral RAM data, uh, near infrared spectrum data for, for this impact crater. And uh, the central figure shows the, the spectrum. This absorption means uh, water, there is water. And uh, this uh, orange line is outside crater, and this blue one is inside crater. So the spectrum shape is quite, shape is quite similar uh, outside and inside. But uh, uh, reflectance is uh, sm smaller in inside, in inside crater. OK, so the second touchdown, uh, we studied a lot around the uh, touchdown region because there are lots of boulders like this. And, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, we confirmed that we can do touchdown uh, safely. And the uh, touchdown sequence is like this. Uh, spacecraft uh, went down to about 30 meter altitude and then hovering. And then again, uh, it went down to the 8.5 meter and hovering and touchdown. So uh, this is a, a image, a movie uh, at the touchdown. Uh, this was taken by the small monitor camera, and uh, uh, the speed is 10 times faster than real uh, motion. And touch, like this. So lots of fragments were blown up. So uh, we are sure that uh, we can get the uh, subsurface material. Uh, this is another photo at the second touchdown. And uh, one more photo, this is quite interesting. Uh, this is uh, uh, this shows the uh, impact crater uh, by the wide-angle camera. This area is the impact crater, and uh, uh, this small dot, this is a target marker, uh, which is an artificial landmark. Uh, we use this target marker to control uh, the spacecraft. And this area, this, this point is uh, Sampra Horn uh, ground point. And uh, finally, the accuracy of second touchdown is, uh, is about 60 centimeter. Uh, the error is just a 60 centimeter. So we, can, we were able to do the very accurate uh, guidance. Okay, so uh, uh, this is a summary of my part. Uh, the impact experiment was successful, and uh, uh, we can make a large uh, crater, uh, uh, larger than 10 meters, was created. The second touchdown was successfully executed at the su surface about 20 meters from the uh, SCA crater. And uh, we think it is quite probable that the subsurface material was obtained. So this is my part, but uh, I, I want to add one thing. Uh, this is quite a new thing. Uh, the operation just uh, today, or uh, in Geneva time yesterday, uh, we did the uh, target marker separation operation uh, uh, in, in, in Japanese time today, but uh, in here, time here is yesterday. 
And uh, we released two target markers uh, from altitude about uh, one kilometer. And uh, these image were just re released. I mean, two, two, hours be two hours before we released this image. So you can see uh, target marker, uh, 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 image of target marker like this. So uh, the purpose of this uh, release is uh, uh, rehearsal of uh, the release of uh, uh, Minerva 22 small uh, rover in, in next month. But uh, we can o observe target marker uh, orbit around the Ryugu. Then we, we can able to determine the gravity field of Ryugu in detail. So this is a very new operation. OK, so uh, that is my part. And uh, I switch to Antonella. Yes. OK, good morning, everybody. As you saw, the, the Ryugu is a very dark object. And so when you see so dark objects, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to understand uh, the composition of the object. Looking at the spectra, no spectra was uh, similar to a meteorite. The meteorites were very different from the spectra of Bennu. And the more similar was, uh, like uh, you can see in this plot, was Ivuna or was a CM meteorites, but was warmed meteorite or shocked. But the behavior is not really similar. So if you see, the, as uh, Makoto told you, uh, mm -hmm. you see the um, feature at 2.72 micron, that is a, a feature of magnesium rich phyllosilicate that means uh, something like serpentine or saponite. That means uh, that water was there sometime during the formation of this object. So what we did, we were trying to, to analyze the, the, the complete object with the statistic. Uh, we use a multivariate statistic method that is very sophisticated and that has been used in the past for many planetary surfaces, really to understand the variation of the surface. So to do this, we apply on the camera data. The camera data, there were seven filters that went from uh, 400 nanometers to 950 nanometers. And the method allowed to have uh, an automatic clustering with no a priori criteria and try to give a very a co different confidence level. So when you choose a confidence level very high, that means that you make a, a probability of wrong decision of only 0.3%, you have two groups. So one that is almost homogeneous, uh, about 97% of the surface, and the other one here is in brown with a very blue spectrum that is 3% of the surface. And you see also differences on albedo. But when you go down in something smaller with a confidence level of two sigma, and which means that the probability of wrong decision is a little bit higher, you see much more classes. And so you can have a finer classification and see the small variation. And so you have something that is more redder in the spectra, something that is more bluer in the spectra, and this gives you some information on the composition. And in fact, when you look the single pixel, you see that the, here, for example, you have the albedo, the reflectivity of the object. And here in this, this is Otaime Saxum, is a, a big boulder, 160 meters on the surface of Ryugu, and it's completely different. It's much brighter than the rest of the surface. And also the spectra here is uh, in red, is much, go, much more going down. And so you, you have a really completely different. So when you bring all these uh, differences in a map, you can compare with the surface of um, Ryugu. And you see that near the equator, you see much brighter uh, material. And this class is really much bluer. So we think that this is due to the space weathering. Uh, we have much younger surface around the equator. And this is also distributed around in the area. And we have analogy with, the, for example, in red, we have the Ejima Saxum, 
or we have analogy with some boulder region. So this is a very good because you have this variation and these are connected with some specific craters or boulder. Or like, for example, here in green, you have the Sandrillon crater. So we did the same also with the spectra, even if, uh, as you saw, the spectra was very thin variation. So we had to push the method to go to see much more. And uh, here, if you see the same, when you go with the very deeper, um, smaller uh, confidence level, you can have uh, some variation. And these variations are real, because you have different in the slope, you have different in the, in the um, spectral signature, and this is important. You see there are variations. These variations are real. And you see, for, for example, with the same code color, there is a variation on this slope of the spectra, on this band area of the spectra. So this means there is variation in composition. But this uh, is also connected with the regolith size. Because smaller is the regolith size, more you have read the, the slope of the spectra. So I don't give all this detail, but I want to show that when you bring also this uh, on the map of Ryugu, this was a map that was published by Sujita at the beginning of this year, you see that there is uh, really some uh, differences on the spectra. There is a variation on the surface, particularly in this area where you have these classes that are represented in red, orange, and brown. So what is the conclusion of all this uh, analysis? The conclusion is that it's true. Bennu is very homogeneous, dark. We don't see much, much stuff <laughs> like variation. But when you go down with some statistic analysis and you decrease the confidence level, you see a lot of variation with different groups on the surface. So these variations are seen with the camera analysis, with the spectra data, and this has been due to the difference of hydrated silicate, even if the band is very small. This is due to the difference with the some fresh material on the ridge, because the material was coming from the pole to the ridge. So we have a much more uh, fresh material around here in some specific region. But then you have all some grain size different. And so all this is uh, shown that there is a dichotomy on the object. And this dichotomy was already found with the analysis of geomorphology on the surface. So now we have this dichotomy that is also confirmed with the spectral analysis. So if you look at this object, you know this is a rubble pile. Rubble pile means a reaggregate of material. So know all these results can give some constraint on the reaccumulation phases of this rubble pile. So this is very important. Um, but all this is published on astronomy astrophysics, that, that uh, paper that is just coming out. But we will have much more discovery with the analysis on the future of the, all these data that are huge quantity of data. We will have still more data with all this uh, uh, Minerva 2, all this uh, new data that will arrive at least up to December. But we will have much more with the sample analysis when the sample will come back. Because you don't have to forget that this is a sample return mission. And the sample will come back on 20, yes, end, of 2020. end of 2020. So just at the end of the next year. And of course, I want to acknowledge all the team of Ayabusa too for this wonderful mission. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm here to talk about um, how you can do uh, citizen astronomy and support NASA from uh, your backyard using a new type of telescope, a digital telescope uh, made by Unistellar. And I'm going to introduce first the concept of the Unistellar. So Unistellar Eviscope is a telescope you can see behind me here. It's a telescope that's been designed for everybody. It's a telescope which allows you to see galaxy nebulae in your backyard in color. He has electronics and uh, sensors, so he allows you to see and to, um, to, 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 to observe uh, galaxy nebulae without knowing anything about 
about the dark sky. Basically, it's kind of a robot, and it analyzes the sky, and from the location and the time of observation, it will give you a list of targets to observe. So that's the cool part of the project and the educative part of the project. You learn about astronomy by observing the dark sky. But we also did um, started a collaboration a year ago with the SET Institute, and the SET Institute will use the sensitivity and the accuracy of the telescope to, uh, to organize campaign of observation, transforming every, every unistellar user into a citizen astronomer. So first, let me just show you what you can see with the telescope. This is what you have, uh, what we, uh, you see with a normal telescope on the left, and that's what you can see with the, with the unistellar EV scope. I remind you that we pre-sold already 2,500 of those telescopes, and the shipping has started. So this is becoming a reality, as you can see here. And if last night you attended our demo, you have seen the telescope in action as well. <laughs> So we are now on the verge of starting science with this telescope, with this large array of telescopes. And one of the scientific investigation we, uh, we prioritize is the study by, of asteroids using occultation uh, events. So an occultation is simply you, uh, if you are lo well located, you will be able to see the disappearance and appearance of a star because, of the, because the asteroid is passing between you and, uh, and the star. So as a user, if you are located no, nearby a path of this occultation, you will get on your phone an announcement telling you that you are uh, close to a path of an occultation and asking you if you want to observe it. You set up the telescope in your backyard, you press a button, the telescope will basically move to the right position, start, acting, start taking the observation, and hopefully will detect the occultation, the disappearance of the star and the reappearance of the star. The data will be sent to the SET Institute and we will process the observation. So there is a, long, a lot of occultation that will be observable with this, um, with this telescope, 40 per day. So to illustrate the, the capability of the telescope, we basically focus on one of them specifically that happened Saturday, last Saturday. Um, that's the occultation by the asteroid Horus. Horus is a Trojan asteroid, and it's basically a, it's a target of the Lucy mission that will be launched in 2021. And Horus will be visited by the Lucy mission, which will fly by the Horus, uh, the Horus uh, aster asteroid. So we don't know much about this asteroid. We know roughly its size. We know, we know its, its orbit. So observation of an occultation like this provide information about the size, the shape, the, if the asteroid has moons or not, and maybe more information, like maybe you could have rings, for instance. So we, um, we collaborated with Marc Bouy and, um, at uh, Swiri and also Lucky Star at the Observatoire de Paris. And uh, Marc sent us a, a prediction for this occultation. And that what you can see at the bottom, bottom left here is the map of the, of, the occulta of the occultation path. So this is roughly 50 kilometer diameter. And here we are basically in Oman. And this is the city of Khalil. If you want, if you uh, like uh, geography, so we send a team over there with two telescopes. This is the team, the Unistellar team, and um, we located a, bar, uh, a station across the central part of the occultation and one slightly offsetted, 30 kilometers away. And what you can see on the figure here, on the, it's basically a movie of the occultation. You can see this star here disappearing. We, it's an accelerated movie. The disappearance lasted four seconds, 4.5 seconds, roughly. So basically, we capture the event. So what we see here is the disappearance of the star because of Horus passing nearby. And Horus is a faint asteroid, so you don't see Horus. You see only the stars being occulted by Horus. From this data, we can get an estimate of the size of Horus, which is 55 kilometers, which was what more or less what we expected based on additional data taken in the mid-infrared. We have now also some very interesting, we know now that the, this prediction, pa uh, prediction path was extremely accurate. Uh, Mark basically used Gaia data, Penstar data to make this prediction. And we were basically uh, observing at the center and we have the, we, co we caught the event. So it means that we are now ready for the next one. And the next one will be very soon. The next event will happen in November uh, 4th of, uh, to f of this year, and it will be visible in the northern part of Australia. So what you have on the left side here is the occultation event predicted before our, our uh, positive occultation. As you can see, the band is now after 
slightly off, offset in toward the north, and more importantly, the error on the, on the band is much more reduced. Because now, we, from this observation, we know precisely the position of Horus as well. So we are, we are much more confident that we will capture an occultation if we are located across this 50-kilometer band, blue band here. So I know that the team at Swiri is uh, organizing a campaign of observation. They will basically go to Australia and uh, use 20 te small telescopes that will observe simultaneously the, um, the occultation to get this time not only one cord but multiple cords and be able to see the, s the shape of Horus and maybe detect the presence of moons around the asteroid. So this is important because thanks to those kind of observation, you can better schedule, plan the scientific uh, flyby of, uh, of Lucy. You can basically know where you, uh, what you're going to see in advance and start planning what can the process, the, the observing mode of the observation. As a user, as a, as, a, as a unistellar user, using this telescope, you can now participate to large campaign of observations. Bec become, you can become citizen astronomers and invest some of your time to, uh, to help NASA to characterize asteroid from your backyard. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll take questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. I am but no, Okay. Hello. Is it working? Okay. I'm Camille Carlisle. I'm with Sky and Telescope. I have several questions, but let's start with two. Um, for the surprisingly large pit that you got on Ryugu, what does that tell you about composition, about structure that you did not know before? Um, and also staying on that asteroid, why would material be moving from the poles to the equator? OK. So first is that uh, we know before that this was a very dark object, similar to carbonaceous chondrite from the observation from the ground. But we didn't have information on details. We didn't have the information of this signature at 2.72. So this uh, feature is uh, very important for the water content, for what we call a phyllosilicate. But uh, it was a very thin one. Uh, was very small. So if you look here, this were uh, the observation in gray. This part in gray was the observation we did at the uh, ESO, European South Observatory. We see that uh, the spectrum was very flat, so it was typical for carbonaceous chondrite. But we didn't have information on the composition. So here in black, you have the spectrum of NIRS-3. And you had this very small signature that is typical of magnesium-rich phyllosilicate. This is like serpentine or saponite. The problem, as you see, is so thin that when you compare it with all the other meteorites, it doesn't fit very well. So one of the work that was done by the Japanese colleague was to compare, and this is published in the Kita Zato paper on science, was to compare with some warm meteorite at higher temperature, like, for example, Ivuna, that is CI meteorites, or the shocked CM meteorite. And so you have a similar trend. But of course, is difficult because you have uh, all is included and mixed together. So the real composition, the real components will be when we will analyze back the sample in the ground. Um, but just to clarify, I was asking specifically about what you saw, that, like why the impact created such a large hole and ah, what that okay. tells you. Oh. Yes, okay. So uh, this is a very good, good question. And uh, actually, before uh, this impact experiment, we, ash we, s we thought the size of a crater may be just uh, two or three meters in diameter. But uh, in fact, the crater size is um, larger than 10 meters, maybe uh, uh, 15 meters in width. So uh, actually, w we were surprised to see this. And uh, uh, so now, uh, 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 the project member uh, is 
uh, members studying this uh, in detail, and, uh, who, and uh, I think soon we can uh, publish the paper. But uh, uh, simply speaking, uh, uh, the gr gravity is very, s very small. Uh, so, uh, and the surface material is uh, not so uh, hard. S so that's why we can uh, uh, the crater size uh, becomes very big. So it's the density. Yes, density is small. And the porosity. Mm -hmm. So it's it's more sorry. It's more porous than you thought it was. Uh, yes, uh, you are right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Oban. I am. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Okay. Um, Karl Orban, I'm freelancer for, for Deutschlandfunk uh, German Public Radio. Um, I have also two questions concerning um, Ryugu. So um, I, I was um, surprised by the color in the inside of the crater. So why is it darker in the inside or is it just a shadow effect on this very last picture? And the second question, uh, what, what did you learn from this impact experiment in terms of planetary protection? So when a, um, um, a body like Ryugo would get close to Earth, which is possible, um, um, what, what did you learn from uh, measures to, to defend against it? Thank you. Do you have a comment about the color? Uh, about colors, we, we saw that there is a much higher reflectivity, so it's darker. And so this is a, it's not only the shadow, as you say, it's a really a different uh, um, way to reflect the light. And so this is, means that you can have also different grain sites. It's very complicated because the reflection of the light depends on many parameters. So depend on the porosity, on the grain sites, on the composition. So this is all connected together. But then what is uh, one of the major results is that uh, the porosity is very high of these objects. So when you go back to the, the planetary defense, uh, I think that uh, such type of object can, uh, are so fragile, so uh, low density, that when they have impact, we can lose uh, this material depending on the way they impact the Earth, for example. So. Of course, first, the impact depends on the composition. It's different if you have iron meteorite, iron body, iron asteroid, or carbonaceous chondrite object. The, and then depend on the inclination in which you have the collision, because if the, the direction is perpendicular, the impact is much more stronger than if the collision is uh, at very a low inclination. So all this is uh, our important parameter. I don't know if you want to add more about uh, the impact le lesson. Uh, yes. So uh, I think this is very uh, 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 important. I mean, very uh, 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 important re result for the planetary defense because uh, f for this uh, uh, took. Uh, the impactor is very small, uh, just a uh, two kilogram copper. Okay, the size is like this, only like this. However, we can make such a big uh, crater. We 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 made a big crater. So uh, maybe from now on we will study how much material uh, uh, was ejected to the uh, planetary space. Then we can estimate the. Uh, uh, effect to, I mean, to uh, to change the uh, orbit of asteroid. So I think this is very good data to study planetary defense. I mean, uh, to change the uh, orbit of asteroid by impact. So okay. Hello, my, my name is Hans Arthur Mosiska. I'm from Germany for Heiser Online. I have two questions. One is quite easy, I think. I would like the, the price for the telescope. 
And the other is on the picture, there is one boulder in the crater that seems to be uncovered from dust and, and seems to be, has, had, has moved after the impact, just one boulder. Is that a, is that a topic of special investigation? Well, the price of the telescope is 3,000 euros on our website. 3,000. You can find it on our website. Yeah. Unistella is a French company based in Marseille. So. Okay, so so your question is uh, uh, this border? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. So right, yes, yes, yes. You're right. So, for example, this border uh, didn't move, but uh, this one moves. So, we think this border is um, uh, much bigger to the vertical uh, uh, direction, but uh, uh, this one is only a. Uh, uh, what shall I say, just p put on the surface. So that's why uh, this border is moving. And we think the impact point is around here, around here. So this border goes, ah, sorry, and, and this way. Mm. Hi, Luca Maltaglia from Nature Astronomy. I have two questions also for the two parts. So concerning the Hayabusa, uh, now that you have the two samples, um, do, you, uh, so do you have an estimate of how much material you actually have? Uh, and for Frank, I wanted to ask uh, first if you have other plan campaign for citizen science in addition to occultations, and was, what is actually the additional uh, thing that the Unistella bring, because of course you can have occultation observations with normal telescopes, so what was the, uh, like the additional contribution that can Unistella can bring? For example, you can observe better occultations in uh, more illuminated areas, or it's more sensitive to, to something, and so on. So. So first, for uh, science cases with Unistellar, uh, occultation is the first one. We can also detect uh, uh, asteroid as faint as magnitude 16. So we can do uh, planetary, participate to planet, planetary defense program as well. Uh, we can also detect exoplanet the size of Jupiter orbiting G-type star. We demonstrated this. So we can follow up tests, of tests and plateau in the future discovery to refine the orbit of those exoplanets, detect uh, the presence of, non of uh, gravitational perturbation uh, due to the presence of even smaller planets, or also um, help refining the orbit of those planets for JWST survey. So as a user, of an of, as a user you will be able to detect those exoplanets to kind of prepare for the next generation of uh, NASA and ESA space telescopes. Um, there is also a lot of different science cases that we are on the process of studying, such as detecting the afterglow of uh, gamma ray burst, uh, and also why not I work at SETI, so detecting uh, the beam of uh, laser communication from extraterrestrial species. It's possible that with this type of telescope, having so many eyes looking at the sky 24-7, we will see stuff that we have been missing over the years. Um, about the addition of um, the network compared to what is done so far, um, one of the advantages is that first it's a, a telescope that you can carry around, so people can basically and set up very quickly. Uh, you will see tonight if you come to the demo, you can basically move the telescope, press a button, it's aligned automatically, so people are uh, will be able to do this occultation more, much more easily. As you may know, when you do an occultation like this, and if there is always something wrong that will happen, some tree will be exactly what you expect, not expecting them to be. Someone will turn on a light, and you will be, uh, you have to move your telescope, so miss by a few, you could miss by a few minutes the occultation. With this telescope, you don't, you, you basically minimize this because it's, uh, it's an easy, easy to align and easy to use. We will also have uh, telescopes all, all around the world. We have sole telescope, in fact, in every continent so far. So that means that if there is an event which is observable, uh, again in Oman and on, in Brazil, we can we will contact these specific uh, observers, asking them to contribute to the observations. 
so that's the, f the first thing. The reactivity is important too. It's a network, it's not only a telescope. So people being able to receive on their phone information about something happening right now, like a new comet being discovered, you're observing, and we get a request from the SETI Institute to observe this comet. You press yes, the observation have been taken by, let's, ask, let's make a big number, for 400 people observe at the same time the same comet. We take all the observation of those comets, we stack them together, and we get, we get the best picture of a comet. So the reactivity will also allow us to do some some, some scientific investigation to react on events happening in the sky. Okay, so uh, your first question about the sample amount. Uh, the answer is we don't know, <laughs> because we, we don't have any sensor to know the amount of sample. So uh, we will know it after we open the capsule. And uh, actually our target mass uh, is just a 0 0.1 gram, just like that. So if we have 0 .0 0 0.1 gram, uh, we can do all the anal sample analysis. But uh, we hope we will have much more than more that. Yes. I have one more question. This is Karl Urban again. Uh, one more question concerning the um, the sample return to to Earth. So what what are the main scientific objectives uh, for the labs afterwards? What what do they want to find out with the um, Rio samples on Earth? Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, your question is, uh, what what is the uh, main science uh, goal? Yes. yes. Sample, yes. So uh, uh, w we want to study the uh, organic matter uh, on the Ryugu. So uh, because the uh, 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 actually we want to know the origin of life on the Earth, and uh, w we we think Ryugu has uh, original uh, matter uh, uh, that uh, became to uh, life. So um, our main uh, purpose uh, is uh, analysis of uh, organic matter on the surface of the Google. Yeah, just to complete, because with the analysis on the Earth, you can have a much more sophisticated analysis that you cannot have in the space. So bringing back the sample, you can do so detailed analysis on the small grain that will real give us really a lot of information. Hello, I'm Thomas Schumann, a freelance journalist from Denmark. I have two questions for Frank. Um, the first question is, uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope, you know, they used a lot of telescopes around the world to pinpoint one source and, and get an image together. Would that also be possible with Unistellar, uh, that kind of science? and? The second one is uh, how freely can you know users of uh, Unistellar just use it for their own purposes? So I'm going to answer to the first question, for, uh, the second question first. So if you get the telescope, you can do whatever you want with your telescope, of course, and uh, observe what, whatever you want. Uh, in the app, we have a list of targets that we recommend because uh, they are beautiful, because they are uh, interesting in the area of, uh, of uh, of the sky that you can see, but of, you can also enter your own coordinate, uh, Radek, and observe any part of the sky you want. So, uh, the data f to get the data, you you have to send it to to ours to us, and we send them back to you in the format that you can use uh, to process to do your own astrophotography or you your own analysis as well. So you have access to your data. Uh, the second question was um, <laughs> the. What was it? Um, it was, you know, with the Event Horizon Telescope oh, that uh, took yeah. the first picture of a black hole, they, I guess the, t the technique is to use a lot of telescopes to get a bigger aperture, mm -hmm. uh, I guess. So Would that be possible here as well? So the Event Horizon is using uh, is a radio, uh, radio uh, array. So in this case, they can do, um, they can combine the, the image by, uh, by using techniques which are way more, uh, more complex than what we're using, interferometry. We cannot do interferometry with this telescope. In this telescope, you basically will be able to combine the in intensity, the images together, to get a very good uh, signal-to-noise image. 
We would be also, something important is that we are kind of standardizing also astronomy with this telescope. So we know how the telescope behave, we know the sensor, we know very well the, the, the flows of the sensor and how to correct them. So when people will send us uh, observation of Liker, for instance, we'd be able to combine them and to get an excellent signal to noise like curve. So much, be much better, uh, much better uh, uh, light curve that if you had multiple telescopes observing at slightly different wavelengths, slightly different filters, slightly different apertures. In this case, they're all identical, so it's easier to combine the data together. All right, maybe uh, one last question. Hello again, Camille again from Sky and Telescope. So uh, to repeat the question I had earlier, why would material move from the pole to the equator on the asteroid such that like, it's brighter on, on the equator? Yeah, uh, uh, this is something that uh, you have to come back to the history of the object. So the probably these objects are considered a rubble pile because they had the parent body and had a collision. And this rubble pile was an aggregation of this material of the fragment during the formation. So this is, is uh, something that for the Yorp effect, when the objects rotate very rapidly, seems from numerical simulation that all the material go from the pole to the equator. And this is, has been confirmed with the, with the Ryugu for the first time. Was really, so it was suspected to be the case for Bernou because we had the radar observation that was making hypothesis on this type of shape, but we didn't know about Ryugu because we were not able to have radar observation before. So this was a really a very good confirmation. So maybe you can explain what the Yorp effect is. Yes, That's you uh, can go with the temperature. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, this is uh, something that you have with the warming or with the temperature of the sun, you know, okay. So one of the idea was that before uh, Ryugu was probably rotating much more faster than today. All right, uh, thanks to all the speakers uh, for that excellent presentation and um, and thank you to everyone who participated. And uh, we'll see you uh, tomorrow at the same time for the third session of the press conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.